Okay, technical analysis is another form of stock valuation and review, stock prediction. It's the more common, believe it or not, it's the more common form of how most analysts look at stocks. If you've ever watched uh, MM, uh, CNBC or MSNBC or any of those shows, uh, Bloomberg, Financial News, anytime they have a news show on and they talk about stocks or the, the investment channel, what they do is they always put up charts to talk about 52-week highs and lows and moving averages, and they never put up a balance sheet and start talking about the balance sheet or the income statement. Or, you know, they always talk about the technical analysis of stocks, and, and they discuss the technical points of stocks. And most analysts and investment traders utilize some aspects of technical analysis. Most academics, however, if you switch over from the real world of investing and analysts and people working in stocks and you jump over to the academic world, they don't like technical analysis. So if you have an instructor, professor who's never worked in the real world and, and got a degree in finance and then came back to teach finance, they're not going to like technical analysis because it's counterintuitive to their mathematical training. So they're all fundamental analysis, mathematical probabilities, mathematical solutions which is fine and that's, a, that's an avenue that works too. But technical is more about experience and intuition uh, and that's something a lot of uh, people with a, a PhD in finance don't have. They haven't really traded stocks or worked for a brokerage or a corporation. They don't know that side of the world, the technical analysis world. And even when I talk to a lot of my colleagues, they'll say, oh, poo-poo on technical analysis. I don't like that. That's, that's a bunch of hoo hockey and you might as well teach them astrology. Uh, so, that's just, you know, that's just what I've found when I've talked, I've gone to conferences and things like that and I've talked to academics. Pure academics do not like technical analysis because they don't really understand it because they're missing that experience, intuition side of um, the real work experience that marries up to technical analysis to make it useful. Now I agree that um, technical analysis is sometimes a concept hard for some people to swallow because it takes a little bit of faith to work with it. Okay, so what is technical analysis? It's basically using published market data, past market data, in an analysis of stock price and in, in individual stocks. Um, basically what we're saying is we're looking into the past historical data and movements of uh, a stock to give us an idea of what it's going to do in the future. Um, so this helps to produce insights and it utilizes what we call a psychological dimension of the market. So the market is driven by people and people are predictable. So that's how the basis of technical analysis works. That people make the same predictable mistakes and attitudes and emotions, fear and greed. So they have a very predictable cycle about how they buy and when they sell stocks. And that translates into, you could witness, witness those past behaviors and the stock price movements and then predict them forward. And it's used quite, rigor, it's quite popular with investors and investment advisory firms. A great deal of investment professionals utilize technical analysis. In fact, technical analysis predates fundamental analysis as a method of valuing and judging stocks. Right, right. Oldest approach to stock selection. Because remember, uh, it was only a phenomenon after, after the Great Depression that investors had access to uh, financial statements. And there's only been a more recent aspect that individual smaller investors have had access to not just financial statements, but records and data that they can manipulate in Excel to calculate ratios and look at the fundamental approach. Before that, uh, you only had the market data to go with, the movements and the volume of the stock to analyze stocks. So that's why the technical approach was developed and, uh, and is in the oldest form of stock selection. So the idea is that prices move in trends and that determines the attitude of investors. So if the stock goes up, investors like the stock. And if the stock goes into uh, a fast momentum trajectory higher, investors are getting greedy and desperate and trying to pile into the stock. They're chasing what's hot. And that's, it's sort of, uh, if you think about trends and fads and people like what's hot. They like the stock that everyone's talking about and they pile into it and they keep pushing that price higher and higher. And, it, and even though there's 8,000 stocks to talk about, generally only 100 stocks get 
90% of the media coverage and talk and analysis. And it's sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy where it's just they keep saying how great it is and people hear that message and they read it in magazines and Fortune and Money and Business Week and they see it on the news and they, you know, and you just can't help but want to buy it. So these attitudes or these um, can, tr can create predictable recurring patterns. And if you can identify the change um, at an early stage, you can ma magnify your investment returns. Um, so they give you signals. So say, for example, you come outside and you say, I think it's going to rain today. And, I, and maybe I'm a visitor to the planet Earth and they say to you, why do you think it's going to rain today? Oh, I have all the signals. There's clouds in the sky. There's a damp feeling in the air. Um, you know, last night there was a blue moon or whatever farmers or people predict the weather when you look around at your surroundings. Uh, the seagulls have flown in from the bay and they're now up here, which always uh, says there's a storm coming. There's different signals you can get to predict bad weather. So that's sort of what you're looking for in technical analysis is the signals to, to predict a change in the stock price movement. So the stock market itself is giving you the data to be the best source of helping you predict where the change comes from. And some of this data includes the price of the stock, how the price of the stock changes and the momentum of that price, the volume, how much the stock is trading and how the volume is changing. Uh, these are among many technical indicators. Those are probably uh, the two most, the two indicators that provide the most data is price and volume. So the technical or technicians have been burned before with trying to, trying to estimate the intrinsic value of stocks through fundamental analysis alone. So they have had more success with the technical side and they probably stick a little bit more to the technical. Um, the market data will help indicate the forces of supply and demand and that in turn will predict where the stock price will go. So the investor's mood is critical to where the stock price is going to go, so, or the stock market. So investors are feeling um, that the future is bright, unemployment is low, the economy is expanding, things are looking good, I'm getting raises at my job, they're going to be in a good mood to buy more stocks. And then at a certain point things change and investors become more pessimistic. And they feel that stocks aren't good investments, stocks are risky, I should move my money out of stocks. So it just goes back and forth from, because it gets to a point where stocks are so undervalued that those attitudes change and more money comes into the stock market. And it gets to a point where it's so out overvalued, investors change their opinion again and take money out of the stock market. So it's this up and down cycle. But on both sides, in the bottom and the top, it stretches too far. It always goes down much more than it should, and stocks always go up higher more than they should. So they outpace the realities of the, fu the fundamentals of the stocks. So me personally, being a professionally trained accountant with degrees in finance, I utilize fundamental analysis quite a bit. I find it very useful. However, being an experienced trader in stocks since I was 18 and working for various companies involved in uh, analyzing valuation companies, and I've noticed that technical has some strong uh, benefits as well. So what I do is, I use the fundamental to create, usually to, to, to track about 200 stocks fundamentally that I know are good companies. Sort of like what you're doing in the stock analysis report, you're finding one or two good companies. Well, I've done that many times over and I have about 200 companies I know fundamentally. Their numbers are sound, their, their management, their financial ratios, their, their companies are, are financially doing well. So now, but they might be too pricey I might not want to buy Netflix at $460 or Chipotle Mexican Grill at $680. They just might be too pricey. So I can use technical analysis to give me an idea when it's a good time to buy the, price, the stock. So I know the stock is good, but I feel the stock price is high. At a certain point, technically, I can use technical analysis to tell me when to buy the stock. So I have 200 companies on deck and I'm waiting for the technicals to line up to a point where it's saying, okay, now is a really great time to get into the stock. Because technically it's been weak and now it's gonna change and be stronger. And I'll show you some of those signals and how to, how to spot the change from weakness to strength and strength to weakness in the stock. So what technicians use 
is graphs and charts, uh, certain technical trading rules and indicators. So they have a toolbox of many different signals that they're going to utilize. Now, there are hundreds of different technical signals. Technical um, analysts generally pick eight to 12 signals that they like or they're familiar with or they're comfortable or works for them and they work with those signals. So they don't, because a lot of them can be conflicting. So you learn, as a, if you're studying technical analysis, you want to learn as many signals and apply them to the stock market as possible. Because you'll find a few of them that, that just work with you, you can interpret quite well, and you're getting good results from. Now price and volume, are, like I said, are the two primary tools of the pure technical analyst. We use price and volume as what's denoted in most charts, and that's what we utilize as, as a mechanism to provide us uh, insight into where the stock price is moving in the future. Now, the volume is key because it, it connects the commitment to the stock. So low volume, a lot of people are not interested. The stock is not, whatever the stock is doing doesn't matter if only two or three people are voting. But when you have very high volume in the millions of shares, then that's a very consistent vote one direction or another and is likely to continue. Now this, um, some of the beginnings of technical analysis go back to the Dow theory. And the Dow theory has three types of price movements. And basically what they say is that there's a primary move of where the Dow Jones Industrial Average is moving uh, through a broad market that lasts uh, several years. Um, and there's a secondary movement that occurs within the primary move and then there's day-to-day -day movement. So think of the primary move as like a long-term 20 to 30 year movement. So in the long term, we've had a bull market or an upward moving stock market for the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, but however, within that 30 year period, there's been secondary movements of downward trends and bear markets that um, you look, if you look at say a, a, a 50 year scale of the Dow, you just see a chart that's going up. So that's the primary move. The secondary move, if you look a lot closer to the chart, you see periods where it goes down a bit, but it always goes up higher and recovers from the previous high. And those would be the secondary uh, moves. And then the day-to-day -day moves of occurrences that randomly um, will occur within the primary and secondary moves. So it's really just looking at taking a big chart, say for 100 years, and say where is the direction of stocks been going for 100 years. And every uh, American index, you see the stocks have been moving higher and you always see these nice inclines in stock prices when you look over 100 years. But if you narrow down to specific five-year periods or 10-year periods, you see secondary movements where stocks may be going in, in a, a counter trend, moving lower for... So the Dow theory is saying, listen, if, if the overall primary trend is still upward, you need to keep your money in stocks and not pay so much attention to these secondary or smaller periods when stocks move lower because it's always going to recover and move higher because the primary trend is upwards. And then within the Dow theory, we have this bull and bear reference to mostly the secondary moves could be uh, phasing back and forth between bull and bear, but the primary move has been in the, uh, the bull phase for the past 100 years. So this is just a very big picture technical analysis saying that, you know, overall, and this is sort of the basis of everyone's investment advice is keep your money in stocks because it's always going to ride out any downward trends. That's been the big retirement advice for the past 50 years, just keep your money in stocks, don't pull it out and just keep adding more money to a dollar cost average because the stock market is continuously going to go up. And that's because of, that means who's ever saying that is a technical a analyst person or whether they know it or not because they're quoting the primary move. The primary move from the Dow theory is what makes the statement about keeping your money invested in stocks continuously um, legitimate. So you might find a lot of people, like I do, I find a lot of people who say they, they hate technical analysis, they're only fundamental, and then I say, well, how should I invest my retirement? Should I always keep it in stocks or should I move it back and forth? And they always say, oh, keep, you keep in stocks for the long term, you don't sell, and that's the, the the common advice is, well, you know, that advice is based on technical analysis. So if you're giving me that advice, then you are believing in technical analysis somewhat. And that kind of blows their mind and they have to go back to their office and cry and think about their whole life again and change their careers. Because um, they don't realize that a lot of, you know, what you're doing 
with your stock investing, even though you believe in fundamental analysis, some of it's based on technical, whether you realize it or not. Now, the bull market can occur in successive rallies that um, will, will penetrate previous highs. And that's why we're counting on for our retirement is that even though we have bad decades or bad recessions and uh, bad downward uh, bear markets, we, these bull markets that are, keep recurring keep lifting us higher and pulling us out of these trenches. Now, we, we know we're in a bull market when we keep going above the previous highs. So some people get scared when they say, oh, the stocks are at the all-time high. And we've been having some of that lately. And some investors say their immediate reaction is, oh, I should sell now when the getting out is good and stocks are high. But the problem is when you're in a bull market, they keep hitting higher and higher and higher points. So you don't really want to get out when stocks finally reach the highest point they've ever been because they've always typically gone higher. Now, in a bear market, um, it, it seems like the collapse of a building. It just keeps hitting new and more and more aggressive lows. The, the, the key thing to technical analysis is to know when is this bull market over and switching to a bear market and when is the bear market over and switching to a bull market. Um, and then within these bull and bear markets you can always have uh, technical corrections. So you can have a bull market and have a 10% correction. Which doesn't mean we're in a bear market, it just means that the market is taking a pullback, they're resi resizing things and they're going to move ahead, sort of like they retreat and then attack again. Um, the problem is if they retreat, get defeated, and the, the, the battle's over, then we're in a bear market. So it's important to know the larger, bro uh, the larger movement of stock prices for your investing, because you don't want to start, you want to think carefully about major investments during the beginnings of a bear market. Steady dollar cost averaging is fine, but if you had a big chunk of money and a bear market's just beginning, you'd probably be better off waiting till more of the bottom of that bear market to put that money in than the top. Say you won the lottery and you have a million dollars to invest. The worst time to invest it is at the beginning of a bear market where you could lose 50% of the value of your investments in six months. It's typically, as technical, on the technical side of it, if I'm looking at a bear market, I'm going to wait till the bear market has been contracted about 30 to 40 percent before I put any big chunks of new money into the market. Because historically, technically, the bear, the bear market will take stocks lower 30 to 50 percent. So if, I'm, if stocks have only gone down 20 percent in, in a bear phase, I know there's more to go. Okay, so the, the, the put to calls ratio is a technical indicator. So the CBOE is the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, and options are um, a, few, is a derivative contract that you can take out on stocks. And you, so instead of buying the full stock, putting your full money in the stock, you're paying a small piece of money to get. Um, the right to buy the stock or sell the stock in the future. So speculators who buy calls, so if you're a speculator, and this is usually the more advanced, more educated investors who speculate on uh, puts and calls. So call is like buying the stock long, put is like selling it short. So if a speculator buys calls, he's expecting stock prices to rise. And if speculators start buying put contracts, they expect the stock price to fall. So seeing the ratio between the put to calls and how that changes gives you an idea of the sentiment of these more advanced investors. So if the, if the ratio rises, so a rise in the ratio of put options purchase to call options indicates pessimism. So basically if more puts are being purchased, that's pessimistic. If more calls are being purchased, that's optimistic. So this would be a buy sign. And so extreme reading of below uh, 0.7 or above 0.9 would really convey what to do. And this, this is something just saying that the average small investor doesn't use options too, too, too often. So we want to pay close attention to what the more advanced investors are doing with the put to call ratio. 
Now, the market, other market technical indicators, market volume of the total market, not just the individual stock, um, is very uh, important because we want to know if the market's strong or weak. So the idea is if the market goes down and you're sort of sad, oh, the market went down 100 points, but in very light or weak trading, weak volume, it's not that important. However, if the market goes down on very heavy volume, it's more significant. So the volume tells us how significant the move is. And this could be applied to the whole stock market or even an individual stock. If you're looking at an individual stock, it just happened to be that five people wanted to sell the stock today and nobody wanted to buy it and it went down $2. That's not as significant as if you know, a million people sold the stock today and it went down $2 because that's a lot more volume on the downside. So it just really shows us how many people are voting, yes, I like the stock, or no, it's time to sell. And the more people that vote, especially if volume is unusually higher or lower, then something is fundamentally changing. So if you have an average volume that's pretty consistent, and all of a sudden it's three or four times an average volume, there's some, port, there's some data point out there that you need to discover because everybody else has and they've already moved the stock based on it. So the breadth of the market is looking at the number of stocks that have moved higher versus the number of stocks that have moved lower for the day. So if you go to Yahoo Finance, they'll give you the advanced decline numbers and it'll show you how many stocks today have moved up and how many stocks have moved lower. So this is another technical indicator. A strong market, of course, is when more stocks are going up than going down. And a weak market is when more stocks are declining. So again, you're using this as another tool in the technical toolbox. You're building evidence, just like you're a lawyer on a trial, you're building evidence to say, is the stock or the stock market going to go higher? So if you see strong volume and you see um, more stocks advancing than declining, you start to build a case that the stock market is going to continue to move higher. These are all signals saying where the stock market is going. So it's just another tool. And this, can, again, can be applied to an individual stock or um, the stock market in total. Now, short interest is another technical indicator. And we've talked about selling stocks short and that creates a percentage of the shares of the stock that's sold short. So if there's 100 shares outstanding of a stock and 10 shares are sold short, the short interest is 10%. So we look at the number of stocks that have been sold short at any point in time. And then we want to um, get an idea of how that's changing. So if the short interest is growing, it's going from 10% to 11 to 12 to 15%, that means more and more advanced investors, because usually only the more advanced, experienced investors will sell a stock short. Average or small or, or uneducated investors just buy stock. But a more sophisticated investor will start selling, and then they'll start short selling. So if the short percentage is increasing, there's more negativity surrounding the stock, because all the professional people are saying, dump this stock. Um, and the same thing, if the short interest starts to contract, maybe at a 20% short interest and it starts going to 18, 17, 15%, then the smart money's reversing their positions and that might be time to get in as well. So two different interpretations, a measure of future demand for the stock. So now if the, sh the short sales are, are very high, that's gonna have to generate future stock um, purchases to cover. So if there is um, a huge position of short percentage, and even the worst stocks, sometimes the short percentages get too high, and then the people who have shorted the stock say, okay, now it's time to buy the cover. So when they buy the cover and reverse the short sell, that's putting extra upward demand on the stock price. So even a dead stock like Enron went from, you know, that went from $100 to $3 back up to $8 because people are covering their short sales, creating this demand, because in order to capture your profits, you have to reverse their short sale, which is basically buying the stock back. So when the short position gets too aggressive, too high, it generally is gonna um, give you, uh, it's gonna say that future demand has to increase. Uh, but that's at an extreme. So that's why you want to see what, you want to sort of track the movement of the short interest 
on a day-to-day -day basis and see if it's, if it's continuing to increase, 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 you want to sell that stock or you want to sell that stock short and join them and make those profits. Once you start seeing that, that short percentage interest has topped out at a certain percentage, maybe it's 25%, and now starting to come back down, then that's time to move out yourself. But the problem is a lot of people are watching this and they move in and out quickly, so you don't have a lot of time to decide. That's why you set up special orders to um, help trade this electronically, because so you, you can't watch every stock every minute of the day. So if I see a stock, typically in my rules, if I see a stock, most stocks I expect to have a short interest between 1 to 5% of the outstanding shares. If a stock has more than 5% short interest, then I'm suspicious. So I'll follow it. If it goes from 5 to 10%, then at that point I'll usually sell it short. Because usually once it reaches 10%, there's a good chance it has strong momentum. It'll get to 15 or 20% sold short. <coughs> All right. So let's look at some contrary options in odd lot trading. We want to look at what, as an experienced investor, we want to see what the small investor is doing. We want to kind of spy on the small, uneducated, um, short term, just, in, just started trading the last few years type of trader and see what they're doing. Because we want to do the opposite of them. Because the small traders, they come in, they make the same mistakes every cycle. They get, they get whipped up into being part of the, the bull market at the end by all the news coverage, all the magazines. So they jump in the market and they start buying everything at the end and pushing stock prices even higher, even to more crazier heights and sort of the last rocket fuel of the bull market. And then all the professional people start selling and uh, cashing their money out of the market while these small investors are putting money in. And then when the market turns, the small investors are the ones who get lose the most money and they're the ones that will sell the stock uh, at the bottom of the market and that's when the professional money moves back in. So that's why it's important to follow and track the small investor and one way we can track them is odd lot trading because professional investors have a secret code. The secret code is you only trade in blocks of 100 uh, shares, so 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000, 10,000 shares. That's how you trade. You don't buy 43 shares or 95 shares or 125 shares. You buy in round lots. That's how we separate ourselves from the small investor. So I can use this odd lot trading to see what percentages of the trades are in round lots and what percentages are in odd lots to give me an idea of the volume of the small trader. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that the small traders will do the opposite of what should be done because they're novices, they're new, they're emotional, they're not professionally trained, they probably don't have professional work experience. So they're going to panic and sell when the market is low and get scared like little babies. And then they're going to speculate and jump in when the market is high. So they're going to jump in on the bandwagon. Uh, and they continually never disappoint and continuously always do this. Um, so the bull market is when odd lot sales significantly outnumber odd lot purchases. So when, um, and the bear market is when odd lot purchases significantly outnumber odd lot sales. So if that seems opposite to you because that's what the small investor is doing, they're doing the opposite of where the market is going. So the small investors are constantly making these similar mistakes where they're buying stocks when they shouldn't be and they're selling stocks when they shouldn't be. So as a, tech, as a more experienced investor, we just need to know, get an idea, if we're the market's at an all-time high, we want to know who is buying the stocks right now. If all the professional people and, and experienced traders are buying stock, then we want to be in that stock market. But if we see that they have stopped and the, the odd lots have increased and now it's just the small investors buying stock, we know that we should pull back and take advantage of the small investor who are pushing prices up higher and capture that because they're simply, it's soon going to change. Okay, so the advanced decline line, the difference between the stocks closing higher and the stocks closing lower on the previous day. So we could plot this on the graph. So if we have 500 stocks moved higher, 400 stocks moved lower, we have 100 stock difference, we kind of plot a movement up 100 stocks. Next day, uh, 400 stocks move up, 600 stocks move lower. We have a deficit of 200 stocks. 
we make that point goes down 200. So we, we can track the, the advanced decline by just subtracting the stocks that move higher from the stocks that move lower. So of course, when ad advancers outnumber decliners, it's a bull market, and when declining stocks outnumber advancers, it's more of a bear market. So by plotting this, we can see an overall trend. We can see that you know, in, in, in bull markets, most days, more stocks move higher than move lower. So as long as that trend keeps continuing to happen, we're going to stay invested in stocks. But in this advanced decline line, if we see something, you know, a suspicious trend of more stocks declining than advancing over a period of time, we know that a bear market is forming and we need to move out of it. So this is another tool that you can apply, generally is applied to the total market, or it could be applied to a specific industry. New uh, highs and lows, 52-week highs and lows. How many stocks now have hit their 52-week high today? So we have 25 stocks have hit their 52-week high, and then five stocks have hit their 52-week low. And of course, when more stocks are hitting their 52-week highs, we're in a bull market. And that's another indicator that, that okay, things are good, we're still in the bull market, because on a, on a daily basis, more stocks are hitting their 52-week highs and hitting their 52-week lows. And we can also track this um, by subtracting the difference. So 100 stocks hit their 52-week high, 40 stocks hit their 52-week low. We get a positive 60 stock difference of more stocks hitting the high. And we can track that on the 10-day moving average as well and get a plot of trend to see is this a continuous upward trend. Because in a day, this could flip, but one day means nothing. But 10-day average means something more significant. So in a 10-day period, are we having more advancers than decliners? So that's why we want to create these moving averages and smooth out these numbers a little bit so you don't have the, the daily fluctuations on cloud your judgment. You can look at things at one month, two months, 10 days, and get a better idea. Is the market still propelling itself higher? And 52-week highs is a good way of knowing this, the market is going to reach new highs. So another tool, and again, this is that these technical analysts do, is they go and if they we're going to talk about the market in general, say the top-down approach, you do the economy, then you think about the market's reaction to the economy. Technical can also be there at the top end, to sort of at the first step to see is the market in the bull or bear phase. And using 52-week highs, uh, new high and low, um, using the advanced decline line and the odd lot trading, these are things that can help confirm that the market is moving higher. It's a good time to buy stocks. Okay, we'll see. Okay, so another, uh, this is an indicator I use quite often is the mutual fund cash flow uh, ratio. And what we want to know is the amount of um, the mutual fund cash position divided by the total assets of the mutual fund. So what this is looking at is that mutual fund managers can keep a certain percentage of their funds in cash. So remember that most mutual funds uh, if people want to sell them, they have to give the, the actual cash back. So if you own a mutual fund and you want to sell out of it, you're going to have the mutual fund manager, if he's 100% invested in stocks, he's going to have to actually sell stocks to give you your cash back. He's going to sort of have to uncreate those shares of stock. So if the mutual fund manager feels that the market's going to go lower, they're going to start accumulating cash and not investing it. And they're doing this because they realize people will start wanting to sell and they'll have the cash. But they're also doing it because they realize the stock price is going to go down and the return of their funds is going to be lower. So if the mutual fund uh, cash ratio, if they start having a larger cash position and that cash position is growing, which is important, if you see that overall in aggregate that the, the mutual fund cash position continues to grow, then we know that they're hoarding cash because they're they're, they're feeling like stocks are going to go down. They don't want to put more new money in stock, into stocks if they feel that the stock prices are going to be lower in the next six months. So at a certain point, these mutual funds, during a downward uh, bear market, these mutual fund cash positions get quite large. And as soon as the market sort of turns the corner, these mutual fund managers run in to spend that cash at the low points of the market because they're a little bit more experienced investors and they time the market. So as long as these mutual fund cash positions are steady or decreasing, it's a pretty good time to be in the bull market. And, but 
when you start to see them increasing, at the end of the bull market, you'll start to see these cash positions start to increase. And then the beginning of the bear market, they increase even more as mutual fund managers sell stock that they feel is overpriced and to go down. That's a good time to get out of the market or not invest new money into the market. So we want to look at what the mutual fund managers are doing for two reasons. One, there's a significant amount of the volume in the stock market and the direction of the stock market. And two, they're experienced lifelong traders that um, typically can make more advanced judgment calls on the buying and selling of stocks than you can. Okay, on balance volume, and this is going to track the volume to price change relationship in a running total. So we're going to look at the stocks that are closed higher with an up volume, we can add, and then the down volume, the stocks that are closed lower, we can subtract. So we look at, put all the stocks, say we have 1,000 stocks. 600 stocks have moved up higher, so we want to add up their volume. And then 400 stocks have moved lower, so we want to subtract that volume from the total pool that we just created on the upward momentum. So maybe we have 5 million shares associated to the stocks moving higher, and then we have 2 million shares on the stocks that are being sold and moving lower, um, or they don't have to be sold, there's 2 million in volume, because volume is a buyer or a sell. You buy a stock for 100 shares, you sell a stock for 100 shares, the volume's 200 shares. Someone else buys it again for 100 shares, now the volume's 300 shares. So the volume is a collection of the buying and selling. So that's why you look at all the stocks moving higher, that becomes your base volume. And then any, any of the stocks moving lower, you subtract that from the base, and you get an idea, is the volume more closely tied to the stocks moving higher or the stocks moving lower? So if the volume is tied to the stocks, the higher pool of volume is tied to the stocks moving higher, we're going to say that's more of a bull market. When the on balance volume, when you plot it on the chart, continues to move higher, meaning that there's more trading momentum and volume with the upward stocks than with the downward stocks, we stay in the bull market. And we, we calculate this every night at the close. So the direction is quite important. When that direction, so that chart, if it keeps increasing, it's a little flat, but keeps increasing. If we start to see a downward trend, 10, 10 or so consecutive days where the on balance volume is moving lower, then we know something's changing. We continue to monitor it. And so if we see a long trend of this occurring, we know that the smart money is starting to sell and they're moving out and they're pushing the volume, especially the volume's increasing, but there's more volume associated to the stocks that are moving lower. We know that fundamentally something's changed in the overall market. It may be time to pull back on our investments or not invest new money. Now again, a lot of this is for active traders, not for retirement. So retirement, you don't pay attention to any of this. You can keep just reinvesting your money on a continuous dollar cost averaging. But if you're a mutual fund manager, remember this class is investment analysis for potential people potentially going to careers in um, financial advice, financial planning, uh, uh, mutual fund analysts, stock analysts. And for these people, you need to keep an eye on these things to know the direction of the market because this will denote how much of your portfolio that you're managing should be at risk in the market. So 100% is, you know, a, you don't want to have your money 100% stocks when the indicators are saying the market's likely to go into a bear phase. That's just, you know, not going to get you ahead of the pack. Okay, so that brings us into charting. Now, charting is, a lot of these indicators that I just talked about, they're all placed on charts. So charting is just a visual representation of what's happening in the marketplace. So we, we can more easily comprehend and interpret the direction of the market by seeing it in a chart. And it's quite, you know, quite easily, is it moving up? We know everything's fine. When it's moving down, there's a problem. So visually, we can, we can digest and, and reflect on the information a lot more quicker than just the numbers alone. So that's why a lot of technical analysts utilize charts more often. Because we like that visual view of the activity. And it's you know, easy to spot or record the trends or multiple trends. Um, and, but there are many different types of charts to work with. The most common would be a bar chart that would show the changes in stock price over a period of time. Um, it's often to use the, the current 
compare the current stock price to moving averages. So we'll have um, a moving average is just adding up the stock price for a certain period of time and dividing it by those many days. So if you add up this, um, for 50 days, you add the stock price every day together. So if the stock is 50, the next day the stock is 40, add that's 90, the next day the stock is, so you keep adding and accumulating for 50 days, then you divide by 50 and you have sort of a moving average. And that is telling too, because it's not, <clears throat> you're ignoring the day-to-day -day fluctuations and getting a bigger, longer picture. So a lot of the charts are going to reflect, um, going to utilize these moving averages that can get plotted every day along with the stock price to give us an idea of how um, the stock is changing. And we'll go into that a lot more later on. Okay. So this, this could be a bar chart. And there are a couple, a couple of things in this bar chart that I should point out to you. Now, it's not a line chart. Line charts are used quite often, too, but this is specifically a bar chart. Now, in the bar chart, it gives us some information on a daily basis. If you look at the key, the bottom of the purple bar is the low price for the day. The top of the purple bar is the high price for the day. And in the middle is the closing price. So not only does it give us a range, when there's a huge range, we know that the, the stock has been pretty volatile that day between the high and low price for the day, but it's very important to see where the stock price ends. If the stock price is, is usually ending at the top of the range, that's bullish or good, because it means that the stock is finishing strong. If this starts to change, and we start to see that it's, it's closing lower and lower to the low end of the bar, then we know, okay, something is happening where the end of the day is the most telling spot for the stock. If the stock keeps closing lower and lower on that range, it's more negative and negative. So, you know, when it starts to change, though, it becomes positive. So we can kind of track it here. We see, you know, it's more pessimistic here, but then more optimistic. So it's just giving us a, more, a little bit more data about the range of the stock price and where the, the ending stock price is, is ending at the day. And that's why sometimes the bar charts we like because it gives a little bit more data. Um, now there's also this uh, point and figure charts that, that use these X and O patterns. Um, so you place an X, on the up days you place an X, and on the down days you place a zero. We're talking about the price of the stock. So we can look at uh, a pattern. Because it, if you've ever played roulette, you ever seen roulette maybe for fun on the internet or at a casino? and you, you spin the wheel and you take the ball and you spin it the other way and then you know that you could, you could make a bet on black or red. So you could double your money if you bet the ball's going to land on the black number versus a red number. And then you walk up to the roulette wheel and you see that in the last six spins it's all landed red. What's your first inclination of where you want to bet for the next spin? You'd want to bet on black because you say, okay, it's, statistically it can't keep landing on red forever. So I'm going to, I'm going to, it's time even though each spin is independent and it's really not predicated in the previous spins, but you still feel like black would be a better bet than red if it's come up red the past six times. So this chart is sort of using that philosophy that, you know, so here the way you plot it is the stock price went up, stock price went up, stock price went up, stock price went up, stock price went up. So for each individual stock you may get an idea of how many days in a row does the stock price typically go up before there's a pullback, because no stock price continuously goes up every day forever. The, even the best stocks usually have a, a cooling off period. So if you see an unusual trend, maybe most stocks, they cool off two or three days and they start going back up again. If you see a trend where the stock price has gone down for many consecutive days, at a certain point you're going to hit the bottom of that and you know that it's likely to start to change the other direction because now the stock price is a little overvalued or a lot overvalued. So it should be starting, so what some analysts do is they wait to the first day in a long train of downward movement, the first day the stock price actually moves up. Then they put their money in it because it's likely, if it's, if it's likely to keep moving up. But you have to know each individual stock has their own fingerprint or characteristics. So some stocks may quite frequently switch between up and down. So this chart would not really be that helpful if it's, if it's not showing you many cycles to invest. But if it's a stock like this, 
that typically has long periods of multiple days moving up followed by multiple days moving down, you could kind of use this at the turning point when it, you know, you know, for example here, it went up for a, con a lot of consecutive days and then went down and this stock, whenever it changes direction, it continues in that direction for a couple days after. So we could short sell it, knowing it's going to go down a few days and the first day it moves up, we know it's going to be a, at least two, two days where it's going to move up. So it's just sort of, you know, think of it over here where it went down, the first day it moved up, if you bought that stock, you'd have all these days of hitting, of the stock moving higher. Two days is moving lower and you can move back in, sell it, then move back in and it's moving higher. So you can kind of play this, this point and figure chart. If you have a stock that plays like this, you know that you could just kind of watch this chart and when the stock price changes, you could move in and buy it because you know it's going to um, have, it's typically never one day of upward moving prices. It's always followed by two or three days of higher prices. So again, it's just following the pattern. Some stocks have more reliable patterns than other stocks. And sometimes it come, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that if everybody's expecting to do it and they're placing their money on it, it's going to make it happen. So that's some of the, 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 the effects of this technical analysis is that sometimes just by people expecting it to stock behave a certain way and betting on it, they're reinforcing it. So unless something significantly changes in the overall real valuation of the stock, either they buy a new company or they have a loss or they lose a patent or something like that, um, this predictability and these patterns seem to repeat themselves because the human behavior makes it a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's one explanation of why it works sometimes. Now, the chart formations, um, it's sort of interpreting the chart, the patterns that occur in the chart to look for certain formations or historical um, configurations that mean something. So what we're looking for is what we call breakouts and resistance. So we're looking for a stock to break out a particular trading zone range, because some stocks trade what they call sort of snake, the snake in the tunnel, where it just goes to the bottom, the top. So it trades between $10 and $15 continuously, continuously for a long time. But at a certain point, it breaks out of that $15 top and starts to move higher, and that would be a breakout that we want to see, because when the stock breaks out of a trading range, that's significant and typically moves significantly higher once it breaks out of that trading, trading range. If a stock breaks below the support of a trading range, then that's very negative. And we don't want to own a stock that's gone to a new, sort of like a new plateau, a new level. You know, sort of like a video game. Stocks play in a certain level, and when they defeat the end boss of that level, they move to the next level. And that's why if a stock does move to the next level, you know it's going to be a progression to the end of that level. You want to get in on it. Um, so when the, price, the stock prices change, they can be recognized and categorized. Uh, we we want to break them into support price levels when there's going to be, um, typically a, a stock lands on support. So there's like, say the $10 level is the support level. If the stock hits $10, people rush in to buy it and it pushes it back up. So a lot of stocks develop these predictable support levels where People have program trading, computerized trading, where it says, you know, they have these um, uh, limit orders to purchase at this stock hits this level, buy it. I want more, you know, so it, so it forms this nice support. So whenever the stock through daily sales hits this low support level, a bunch of mutual fund managers and individual investors rush in to buy it and it bounces off the support. And it could do that numerous times. And it's very beneficial if you have a computerized trading scenario where buy it, buy it at 10, buy it at 10, buy it at 10, buy it at 10, you keep buying it at the low, and then if you have a resistance level at say $15, every time it hits $15 you sell, and you wait to go back 10, you buy, then it hits 15, you sell. So if you have a stock stuck in that trading pattern, and you have automatic trading, buying and selling, you can make a lot of money just turning the stock back and forth by buying at 10, selling at 15 continuously throughout the year. And that's how some computerized trading works. Now, not all stocks stay in this particular, particular trading behavior forever or even long periods of time. It may just be a six month thing or a one year or it could possibly be two years. But that's why we need to figure out what is the support level and the resistance level um, so we can identify the trend or direction. Uh, and we also like to know the momentum, the speed of the price changes. And this can be done for an individual stock or a whole market. So a lot of times these news, these CNBC or 
MSNBC uh, or Fox Financial News or one of these, these, a lot of times they'll put up market charts and they'll say that we've hit a new resistance or, uh, or we've broken through the resistance and now the market's set up to move to a new level. And this can be done for bonds as well as stocks. So a lot of times when you're reading financial press, you'll hear them talk about, you know, breaking out of these trading ranges and things of that nature. They're just talking all technical analysis. And they're saying, you know, when a stock or a market or a bond um, goes below a particularly previously supported level, that means the game has changed. And you need to rethink how you're going to approach this investment. And typically for a lot of people, when a stock goes below the support, they just want to sell it. So even though you may have bought it at 10 when it hits the support, if it goes to 9, then you just sell it anyway because it's probably going to 5. You know. Here are some popular chart formations. Uh, <coughs> you can see here in the uh, triple top, here's the resistance and support level. So if we have it, typically we had a pattern that repeated three times where it hit the top of the resistance in a close succession, maybe within a few weeks or a month. Uh, and then in the th on the fourth time, this would be uh, one, two, three, on the fourth time it actually penetrates the resistance, that's a breakout. And stocks typically go much higher after that. So this pattern, when we see it, it's going to test the resistance three times. On the fourth time, this is like in a close succession. This isn't over six months. This is over you know, a few weeks or a few days. On that fourth time, if it penetrates the resistance level, that's a breakout. And that's why you want to buy that stock um, when it sort of gets in this area, that's a good time to buy the stock. It's counterintuitive to most people because most people see the stock at a new high, they're afraid to buy it because it's expensive. But that's why when you use your consumerism as an inexperienced investor, you always make that mistake. I want to buy stocks that are moving higher. I like stocks with momentum, the stocks that are breaking out of the resistance, so I always buy the stocks that are not on sale, the stocks that are more expensive and are moving higher. You know, if I felt that way about Netflix when it went from 60 to 100, saying, oh, that's too expensive now, it's, it's, it's going past its top typical high, I would have missed the move all the way to 450 when that breakout occurred. Same thing for Amazon, Chipotle Mexican Grill. A lot of them had these chart patterns and then the breakout happened and they just shot up. Um, most people's reaction is, oh, I want to buy a stock after the price has gone down quite a bit. Just like when you go to Kohl's and you want to buy something that's on clearance. Because, oh, it used to be $160 and now it's selling for $6. You like that purchase. But what if that piece of clothes is ugly? There's a reason no one bought it and it's on sale. Then it's really worthless to you because you'd never wear it. What you want is the stocks that are not on sale, that are having higher prices. If you went in the store and a sales clerk right in front of you, there's a sweater you like, they move the price from $25 to $45, you wouldn't buy it. You say, oh, it's too expensive now. That works fine. It's smart in the consumer world to think that way, but not in the stock world. And that's why individual investors treat stocks like they're going to Kohl's and they try to buy what's on discount or sale or clearance. And that typically never works out because those prices typically continue to go lower. You want to buy what's up and coming. Now in the head and shoulder, this is sort of the inverse of it. You may get a situation where it's going to test the support three times and then the fourth time if it, break th if it breaks through the support line, then that's a very negative thing. You as an inexperienced investor might say, oh, it's at, a, it's at the all time low, it's, it's the stock's hit a low price, it's really discounted on sale, I'm going to buy it and feel great about it, I'm getting it so cheap. Well, cheap things continue to get cheaper in the stock market. So if it breaks in the head and shoulders pattern, if that breakout is a, a warning sign to stay away. You could have what are called these um, triangles could form where um, there's a downward movement of resistance and that would be a sell. Sometimes flags or pendants form. If a flag or pendant formation occurs within the chart, that's typically a buy sign, specifically when a, a flag is followed by a pendant. If you have these consolidated triangles, where you see these are for, forming some very triangle-like patterns between the top uh, resistance and the bottom support, typically on the, after it touches, the, when it touches the top on the fourth time, if you have those nice looking triangles, that's going to be a, uh, a breakout or a stock you should buy. And again, it's sort of like, do you remember maybe when you were kids, they had these what they would call 3D 
pictures. And you'd look at them. It looked just like a bunch of gray boxes or static. And you stare at this picture long enough, your eyes unfocus, and a shark, a shark pops out. It'd be like a 3D puzzle. But you can't see it right away. You have to stare at it for a while. That's sort of like sometimes what these charts are. You don't always see that shark in the chart. And so you kind of analyze it. You stare at it for a while. And then you see these movements, these, these pendants and flags and triangles. Um, there's also the inverted saucer, if this was like a cup. Um, and that's typically you know, a bad sign as well. So these are just some of the popular chart formations. There are many more. Typically, like I said, there, you start to develop your own chart formations or patterns that you start to see uh, um, become a little bit more effective to you, a little bit more personal to you. So sometimes these popular ones can be a starting part, but you may actually discover new ones because each stock is going to have their own sensitivities and their own patterns. So if you watch a stock long enough, you get to know that certain patterns will form in the chart that's going to predict stock price moving up or lower. That's why technical analysis <clears throat> isn't for academics because they typically don't study an individual stock or stock market in an investing point of view on a daily basis. Like I will go every day and look at every ch the chart of all 200 of these stocks and just kind of see how it's slowly changing and then I'll get a memory of, you know what, I remember this stock doing something similar four years ago, there's going to be a change, stock price is going to go up. Because that specific chart has its own specific patterns that you can't really place in one of these neat little popular chart formations. Each chart usually has their own specific patterns that they follow. Because they have their own, a lot of stocks have their own unique investors, their own mix of institutional, small, and, and advanced investors that produce unique fingerprints or patterns within those charts. So, it, so in technical analysis, it's very important that you follow the stock for a great deal of time so you get familiar with that stock's fingerprint on their chart. Okay, so moving averages here. These are some of the best tools to show us the support and resistance levels and the breakouts of the support and resistance levels. So we want to track data uh, over longer periods of time and smooth them out through these moving averages. And we can calculate them. Typically, we, work, we only work within the window of 10 to 200 days. Uh, I myself find that the 50 and the 100, 100 day are very useful. Some charters like the 50 and the 200 day. So there's different, um, as a technical analyst, you have to figure out what works best for you. Most, most pairings are 10 and 50, 50 and 100, 100 and 200, or 50 and 200 are different pairings of the because you have to look at, <coughs> typically you want to look at at least two moving averages, if not more. All right. So here's a 100-day moving average chart. And what we're looking for is, now these are the bar of the actual stock price movements. When the stock price actually penetrates above the moving average, that's a breakout. So that's when we want to buy the stock. And if the stock moves below the... Um, moving average, that's a sell. So we can kind of line up these buys and sells based on how the stock penetrates the moving average. And that's sort of, and this is just, it's not as useful to have one moving average. You always like to have maybe two. It gives you a better coupling of signals of moving averages. So in the next presentation, I'm going to actually um, put up real stock charts and moving averages and show you the predictable movements of support and breakouts of those stocks, where the stock is generally heading. So to give you a little bit more um, real world experience and how to look at these formations and these moving averages to predict where the stock price is going. So I'll actually do that next, uh, in the next presentation.